Important podcast, important podcast. Important podcast, important podcast. Important podcast, important podcast. Important podcast, important podcast. What's going on? Welcome back to the Important Podcast, this special segment, the Beyond Homo Sapien Podcast. I'm joined here by my friend, Muzzin Corbury, and um, he is a doctoral student who is uh, studying the effects of generational trauma and really trying to dive into like, what is that and what is it all about? And before we just hit record, um, you were diving into the, you know, what happens when mice are exposed to trauma. And I was wondering... Um, if you wouldn't mind just kind of recapping what we were just talking about and sharing like what happens to mice when we expose them to different smells and, uh, and traumatize, you know, and traumatize them over time. Like what is that effect that it's had on the humans? So, uh, over to you, man, I want to hear more about what you were just, uh, what you're just saying. Some, some really good interventions that are working now, um, but so to start, I'm at the University of Arizona. I'm focused uh, on a, I'm working on a psychology doc, doctorate with a uh, focus on health and wellness. Um, my dissertation focuses a lot on depression and PTSD and some uh, non-traditional interventions uh, for these uh, disorders. Um, and we'll get into that in a second, but let's start by talking about uh, I, what we were talking about a little bit earlier is that a lot of African Americans here in the United States um, are a little more predisposed to PTSD. And the reason for that is because epigenetics, this is a evolutionary process that was uh, kind of evolved to prepare offspring for the environment they're going to be born in. Okay. So if I, whatever interaction I have with my environment, changes me at a genetic, at a biological level, right? So if I undergo intense trauma, right, uh, there are going to be changes to my DNA. These methylation changes, we have these uh, 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 things that bond to our DNA that, that uh, kind of dictate how our DNA is going to present itself, right? They're heritable changes. I can pass these, these issues or these, these, these changes onto my offspring. The great thing is, is that our interaction with our environment can turn these on, turn it off, can, can, can make it better, can make it worse. A lot, of, a lot of different things can happen with the way we interact with the environment. Now, to talk about uh, trauma and how it's uh, generational, we kind of found this out through a study uh, at Emory University with mice. Um, and what they did is they would sm uh, spray this aroma. And once they sprayed the aroma, they would shock the mouse. And they just continually did that until the mouse, the mice grew an aversion uh, to this aroma. So they uh, pretty much gained PTSD every time like, they smell this aroma and they freak out because they knew that pain was going to follow that smell. All right? And they knew that was going to happen. What they did not predict is that for generations, their offspring were, were born with this aversion to this smell without ever smelling the smell. Right, so uh, the, these this trauma changed them at a G DNA level, and their their offspring uh, uh, were born with that same aversion. Now we we see this. Uh, they've done studies of um, Holocaust survivors and some some genetic changes that happened uh, with them with the way their body produces cortisol, the stress hormone, because they were under such intense stress for so long. Genetically, that changed them, and that interaction with the environment was passed on to their children. So uh, we know now that, that the way we interact with our environment can predispose us to certain issues. Now let's go further, right? Uh, recently they did a study where they took um, a group of obese men. These obese men were about to get a gastric bypass surgery. Prior to the gastric bypass surgery, they, got, uh, they gave sperm samples and they found that they were about to pass on heritable um, uh, issues with bad health. So they, they would have genetically predisposed their children to bad health, okay? So they all get the gastric bypass surgery. They get healthier. They start exercising, lose massive amounts of weight. A year later, uh, um, these, the same group of men gave another sperm sample. Every single one of those heritable changes had changed back to that of a healthy individual. So uh, the DNA issues that they presented when they were 
having a, a very unhealthy interaction with their environment were changed back once they changed those health practices. And what's scary about that is we all know uh, couples that have one kid that's an absolute nutcase or one kid that's unhealthy and then another kid that's very healthy or another kid that's very even, they're, they're, they have no psychological issues. A lot of that has to do with the environment the parents were uh, in and their state of being when they gave birth to those children. Because we're, we're consistently changing the, the, the way our body, are, the, the way we are made up biologically with our interaction with the environment. So it's pretty scary that years and years and years of trauma have uh, genetically predisposed African Americans and other minorities to PTSD. That's why there's a much higher rate of PTSD among minorities in America, because it's been a lot of trauma. It's been a lot of trauma. Dude, what you're saying is absolutely huge. Like um, this idea that trauma, that these different things can get stored into our body and then passed on to our kids um, sounds a lot almost like generational karma in a sense. Like there's this sort of karmic energy that needs to be transmuted by us at some level. So for example, um, trauma that gets passed down through generations um, almost becomes like a, uh, you know, like a mission for the family lineage, you know, like of how can we heal this? How can we move through it? You know, and um, having the awareness that you're building around this, man, this is what we need, you know, to kind of be able to identify and say like, okay, who's most predisposed to having, in other words, like the most karmic baggage that they need to transmute, you know, that they need to move. And you know, what's, what's, what's funny is that a lot of these religious ideas, like for instance, the Africans um, are very um, into the idea that our ancestors work through us. Everything is about the ancestors. And you know what's funny is there's so much science in that because we are our ancestors. Our ancestors, every action that they had and every interaction with their environment is what we are today. It changes genetically. Those genetics were passed to us. We are, we hold within us their trauma, everything that they've, they've uh, dealt with throughout the past. It made us who we are. And it, it helped us evolve to where we are today, right? So when you talk about karma, you talk about uh, maybe what, what the Africans believe with ancestral um, uh, ideas. It, it's, there's a lot of science wrapped into those ideas, you know? And I think uh, ancient people knew a lot more than we give them credit for because a lot of things that we're finding out scientifically now making a lot of sense today and you know they they were talking about years ago man you hit on it like that's something i talk about on this podcast all the time is the idea that you know the ancient mysteries the ancient peoples of the world they knew about a lot of this stuff like vibration uh the idea you know a lot of what quantum physics is confirming is kind of what i'm getting at this idea that you know for example everything is kind of a, a wavelength at its core you know at its core level and uh when i hear you talking about uh, that you know the Africans and their view of it, it sounds a lot too like the Native Americans. It, they have a very similar sort of idea about the ancestors and working with the ancestor mm-hmm. spirits. And how interesting that both of these groups would be going through a lot of collective trauma here in the United States and here in places all over the world. You know, it's almost like uh, the ancestors of all the world, of everywhere, are all coming together here in 2021 and or the end of 2021, really, and kind of saying like, hey you know, it's time to heal, it's time to move beyond all this, but it requires us to deal with it. It requires us to actually solve the problems that have been with us for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, really. And you're right, man, like all this yes. stuff is still yes. stored in and, our body. For sure. And there, there's a lot of ways that we can look at it, right? So we can look at it as, 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 as baggage or as, as, as problems or I can't believe I have this genetically wired into me. Or we can look at this as an evolutionary advantage. It makes us more prepared, more durable, more ready to deal with a lot of the issues that we're dealing with today. So I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very grateful for what my ancestors went through, what they put in me, and, and, and how I'm able to deal with a lot of the things that we deal with today. And it makes me more motivated to, to push harder and, and make everything a little bit better for my child. 
But um, now, you know, so we've talked about the trauma. Uh, let's talk about how we're going to get around this trauma and make ourselves heal ourselves or make ourselves better. Um, so my dissertation right now focuses on uh, a couple of different models. One, I absolutely hate SSRIs. I hate antidepressants. I think they're very dangerous. I think they're uh, very much a pharmaceutical tool because the idea of, of, of pharmaceuticals and pharmaceutical companies is not to heal anybody or help anyone. It is to create a customer, a long-term customer. So they want something that's going to make you dependent on it for your happiness or your success. They don't want to heal you. They don't want to address the problem. They want to treat you for a lifetime, right? So when you look at SSRIs, they were based on a hypothesis that was not tested, but based on a hypothesis that if I am unhappy, then I must have serotonin deficiency or some neurochemical deficiency because the SSRIs and other antidepressants work on different neurochemicals, right? Uh, different neurotransmitters, neurochemicals. So the serotonin idea, the serotonin hypothesis was if you're depressed, your serotonin is low, you need to do something to stimulate serotonin, and this is what these drugs are going to do, right? So the claim was that your brain's homeostasis was, was off, so we're going to give you a drug to help to increase that serotonin to make you feel better, right? The problem is, is that it went untested. They threw these drugs at us, made our body produce all the serotonin, and there was no serotonin deficiency, right? They've done tons and tons and tons of brain scans. One, there, there's not a perfect serotonin for anyone, right? So we don't know what perfect serotonin is. Two, they've done a bazillion brain scans now, and there's no deficiency in serotonin. 99.9% well, .9 of everybody, even depressed patients, their serotonin levels are fine. So we give them this drug that now makes their body overproduce serotonin. Okay, so one causes suicidal ideation because it hasn't addressed whatever is causing the depression, and now it's going to give you a whole bunch of energy to maybe maybe act on hurting yourself. So that's why suicidal ideation is on a bottle with every SSRI. All right, beyond that, it creates the homeostasis issue that they claimed was the problem in the first place. Right, so now your body is dependent on this drug for happiness. If you stop taking that drug, your brain's homeostasis is jacked up, you're no longer producing the serotonin that you need to be happy and balanced, then you want to hurt yourself, right? You feel depressed, you feel like the world's ending, right? We now have a multitude of medicines, natural medicines, that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt can cure depression at a higher rate than has ever been seen in cl a clinical setting, right? So right now, like, like I told you, my main focus is PTSD and depression, right? Depression right now, we're in phase three clinical trials with uh, psilocybin. Psilocybin is a natural mushroom that grows in every environment on the planet. You, can, you would have to eat your body weight in psilocybin to kill yourself. There's no neurotoxicity. Like the molecule for psilocybin damn near mirrors serotonin. Your body absorbs it, utilizes it perfect, and it does not damage your brain, cause any crazy side effects, doesn't damage brain homeostasis. But they found that one high dose psilocybin session has been shown to cure people of all depressive symptoms. These are untreatable uh, depression, depression patients all depression symptoms for up to a year, up to a year, one session, right? Now, the problem with getting this push through is how is the pharmaceutical company going to monetize something that you take one time and you don't feel sad anymore? You don't feel sick anymore. You're able to, when you're in this highly meditative state that it puts you in, address some of the issues that maybe were hurting you. Maybe some of the trauma that you've tucked away, you were able to address it with an adult mind, right? Um, it's absolutely insane to me that we have years and years of clinical studies 
Uh, right now, MAPS, Imperial College London, uh, are doing amazing work uh, with psilocybin and, and putting it through FDA-approved uh, clinical trials to show its efficacy. The fact that it's on a Schedule One list is abs like, in order to be a Schedule One drug, it should be highly addictive. It should be uh, have no clinical value, right? It is neither one of those things. It has a, a, a huge clinical value, and you can't get addicted to psilocybin. So psilocybin is one for depression. Amazing, amazing, amazing results that we're seeing. Now the goal is going to be getting around pharmaceutical companies and their fight to keep it out of the clinical setting, because they'll fight. They'll, they'll do whatever they can to make sure, as long as they can't monetize it, to make sure that it's not put in a clinical setting. All right. Number two, PTSD. Uh, right now, they treat PTSD with antipsychotics and antidepressants. These drugs have horrible, horrible side effects. Antipsychotics, before they were called antipsychotics, were called oral or, or, or chemical lobotomies. They make you so just blah. You don't have any emotion whatsoever, right? Sexual dysfunction, weight gain, all of these other issues that come along with these drugs, right? Uh, and stay after you stop taking the drug, too. They're, they're, it's not something that just goes away when you stop. These things damage you, right? MDMA-assisted psychotherapy is curing people from, from uh, symptoms of PTSD at the highest rate they've ever seen. Ever seen. I think, and I may be quoting these numbers wrong, but uh, in, in the first, I think, phase two trials, 63% of the, the um, participants, I believe it was 63% of the participants, were undiagnosable for PTSD after three MDMA-assisted uh, uh, psychotherapy sessions, right? When checked back after a year, 89% of the people that weren't immediately cured had processed things in their brain, and they were too undiagnosable for PTSD, of the small group, small percentage of people that weren't completely cured, they had significantly reduced symptoms, okay? They could go back to living. They weren't stuck in their house all day. They didn't hit the ground every time they heard an engine backfire, right? Um, they're in phase three uh, clinical trials now. Uh, um, they have been uh, touted as a breakthrough therapy by the FDA, right? Super impressive. Nothing's ever done this before. The problem, again, is going to be the pharmaceutical company will fight this tooth and nail. Listen, when they decided, i give you a little history here. When they decided to put MDMA on the Schedule One list, a group of psychologists came out and said, this is, this, this, this is a clinical, this is something we're using in a clinical setting. This is something that is great for us. We're using it for couples therapy, for anxiety, for PTSD. And we do not, like, this should not be on the Schedule 1 list. They actually beat them in court. They won in court. They still made it a Schedule 1 drug. The DA still, even though they lost in court, made it a Schedule 1 drug. So we've had 50 years of research where they've had to go to other countries. They've had to duck behind and hide the research in order to prove that it's a viable uh, a clinical option for trauma, for couples therapy, for a lot of different things. So, I mean, that, that's where I'm at now. These are the things I'm studying. I'm doing a, um, um, uh, a comparison uh, um, uh, of, of, of outcomes for SSRI, for um, antidepressants, and compared to the clinical data that we have, because we have years of data with SSRIs, uh, compared to the clinical data that we have for uh, MDMA and psilocybin to treat PTSD and depression, right? And I, I plan to show that these natural, more natural, uh, MDMA is synthesized in a lab, but it comes from sassafras root. So it's, it has a natural origin, right? With no side effects, no, no serious issues, no brain neurotoxicity. Uh, it's, it's something like they did a study, of a couples therapy study. A couple did it every single week for two years and did brain scans monthly, there was no neurochemical damage. MDMA every single weekend for two years, right? Now, this is clean, real uh, um, 
laboratory grade MDMA. It's not the pressed tablets that you're getting in the hood, you know, that, that probably is got all kinds of crap in it, but it's, it's a, a, a clean, healthy substance that you can do that can save your life. that can change your perception. Dude, thank you so much for breaking this down. And I just wanted to also thank you for doing this research because honestly, doctoral students like you are kind of writing the new wave of academia that's going to then come and change this story. So thank you, man, for what you're doing, like for on behalf of the species, you know, like that's really uh, a huge thing, dude, you're doing. And I just wanted to say like, um, this, you know, hits close to home. I've talked about this a lot on the show, but uh, mushrooms saved my life. Like I've had uh, lots of experiences, like in the hundreds with psilocybin, and uh, dude, just completely rewired my brain, completely changed everything, helped me to heal all the trauma that I was still holding on to. And um, so I can vouch for that one 100%, like saying that that's real. And uh, my business partner, Zach Babcock, recently had the MDMA therapy to, uh, to get heal some of his PTSD that he had from being in prison and from having a really traumatic childhood. And uh, dude, it's working wonders for him. Like he's a different guy, honestly, like just since he did this treatment just a couple months ago, like, you know, his whole, uh, just the way he carries himself is completely different. Like I can see that in my friend, you know, that, that uh, he's, he's visibly different, you know, like you can tell it's, it worked, you know what I mean? Game <laughs> Absolute game changer. Um, you know, you know uh, my religious background. You know, I'm very much anti-drug, um, and I, I I don't consider these things drugs. They're medicine, and they're they're medicines that that indigenous communities and and our ancestors were using for years and years to deal with a plethora of disorders and trauma, and we've gotten so into this pharmaceutical idea uh, of the only way we can treat things are with pharmaceuticals. And we wonder why depression is at an all time high. Right now, depression is the number one uh, uh, cause for uh, disability in the world. The world. SSRIs have been uh, in play for over 50 years and depression has only gotten worse. Anxiety has only gotten worse. Right, PTSD has only gotten worse, okay? These drugs are not working. They're not meant to work. They're meant to keep you strung along and strung out, utilizing them and dependent on them, right? Um, I, you know, I, I don't talk about this a lot. I talk about it a little bit on, uh, a little bit on social media because I don't like putting my business out there. So you're going to get it here first. I've utilized psilocybin, MDMA, all of these things to deal with my trauma, to deal with things that I've dealt with throughout my life. Um, if you're black in America, you have intense trauma. You deal with it, you store it, and you live with it, and it eats you alive. Uh, uh, chronic stress is one of the worst things that anyone can deal with, and we wonder why black America is the unhealthiest demographic in America, but there is not a black American that doesn't have chronic stress living in this, this, this country. Right? We deal with shit that... People just don't understand that we deal with, right? Uh, and, you know, I, I had a lot of stuff tucked away, a lot of things that, that were eating away at me, making me not the best person, not the best friend, not like I was just a, a, a really hard individual, right? And through my studies, I, I've, I've helped myself tremendously, tremendously. Um, and uh, when I say, now I'm not telling anyone, so again, this is not any medical advice for anyone. Be, it's good to be supervised, good to have a medical professional. You shouldn't just go grab some shit off the street and take it. It can be dangerous. You have no idea what's in this shit nowadays because people do a lot of bad things with some of these medicines. So don't do that. That's not the best idea. But when I tell you, like there, there, are, there are options in other countries. There are even options here in America where they're using a compassionate use. I know that uh, some states, uh, D.C. is uh, legalized uh, psilocybin. I know it's uh, legalized, I believe, in Colorado and in California now. So, I mean, there are outlets where you know you can get real good stuff. And there's, there's enough information online. You can't hurt yourself with psilocybin. 
<laughs> you know, so you may have an experience and I recommend set and setting being right and being away from negative people. But whatever experience you have is going to be an experience that you need. All right. Now, let's go even further than that, right? Because a small piece of my studies right now, uh, because, you know, I'm a combat athlete, 55 fights. I've been, been getting hit in the head since I was eight years old. Right now, there are major clinical trials with uh, psilocybin and other um, uh, psychedelics for traumatic brain injury and for uh, CTE, right? It's big in our community. People get hit in the head a lot. We have traumatic brain injury, CTE, uh, and, and it, it harms us over the years after our careers are over, right? The thing about these medicines, psilocybin, LSD, they uh, uh, stimulate neurogenesis in the hippocampal region of your brain. Your hippocampus is your center for memory and learning, right? These things uh, 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 promote the growth of new brain cells in the center for learning and memory, right? Uh, right now, it's being looked at for Alzheimer's, for traumatic brain injury, for uh, CTE, for a lot of these neurological disorders that happen within the hippocampal region of your brain. These medicines have so many uses that will put pharmaceutical the pharmaceutical industry out of business. And this is why they've been fighting it for so long allowing these things to be given to the public. And they've criminalized it. They try to yeah, make man. you a bad person for something that's been used for years. Dude, it's, uh, it's changing, though. That's what I feel. Like, it really is changing. A lot of these states and areas like D.C. Uh, decriminalizing it, legalizing it, like, it's going to happen. The information is out there. The old story is just kind of gasping with his last dying breaths because the information is there. It's just not mainstream yet, you know, but it's getting there. And, um, dude, like something I talked about um, actually on the last episode of the podcast, because I've done a lot of research into the ancient mysteries and like ancient um, secret, I guess, secret societies, for lack of a better word. But what I've found is that um, back in the ancient days, this experience of spiritual awakening or initiation, as it was called back then, was orchestrated by the tribe. And it usually had something to do with psychedelic medicine. So, like, for example, Native American, sure. Native American around tribes the world. around the world, Native American tribes, for example, would, you know, when the person becomes of age, they would have a vision quest where they take a usually a shit ton of peyote under the supervision of the medicine man, and they would go off into the desert by themselves and have a spiritual experience. And that the whole purpose was to find your purpose uh, and you know evolve into the next version of, of adulthood, really. And uh, the same was true at the Mysteries of Eleusis, which is a ancient mystery uh, ceremony that happened back in ancient Greece and in ancient Rome, where literally just about every single person in the society went to the mysteries at Eleusis, whether you were rich, a slave, a man, woman, like everyone was permitted to go at least once. And uh, Terrence McKenna talks about this, that he thinks it was a type of mushroom, uh, where if you look at the ingredients, it kind of spells out a sort of code that it's, it's a type of mushroom, basically. So he made the argument that that's what they did during the ceremony was the present you with a, a mushroom brew that you drink. The same... Uh, ayahuasca in south america in the rainforest amazon tribes would you know do the same exact thing but with ayahuasca like so i the reason i wanted to share all that was just to kind of drive home what you're saying like for the listener that um this was not just something back in the day that was done here or there it was the thing you did to get to adulthood like when you were t turning into you know an adult member of society you went and had this experience whether you know literally everyone for the most part and it just got lost over time because of organized uh honestly a lot of christian barbar uh, barbarians well, who killed a lot of people and uh christianity would demonize a lot of this stuff society it would take a lot and same thing with uh a lot of the traditions that happened in south america christianity moved in and and uh, called those traditions demonish or devilish and, and, and stopped those traditions. But every major society throughout history has utilized psychedelics, from the Africans with Ibogaine uh, to the South Americans with ayahuasca, um, the Native Americans with peyote. Uh, psilocybin is actually illustrated on the walls of the pyramid 
the, the, the tree of life on the walls of the pyramids in Egypt is represented by a, uh, a plant that is, is very high in uh, DMT, dimethyltryptamine. So, I mean, there has not been a society throughout our history that hasn't utilized these supplements or these medicines to uh, improve their, their well-being, whether it be neurologically, uh, physically, mentally, these things are medicines that help. Dude, absolutely. And um, I want to, I know you got to run here soon, but I kind of want to end on this. Um, so when, I mean, you've taken these medicines, I've done them before, you know that it's a lot more difficult sometimes than just, uh, uh, you know, uh, just taking it and it's all good. Like you have to actually confront your demons. You have to actually go to that deep place inside of yourself and fucking almost do battle with some shadow version of yourself and then integrate it. So tell me about that. Like, um, especially if there's someone who maybe can't get access to this stuff today, like they listen to this and they're like, oh man, you know, I don't have medical grade MDMA sitting around. Like what's something that people can do to kind of have that same sort of experience, but maybe just without, is there a way without the medicine, you know, where they can go in and do some of that shadow work uh, without it? You know what I mean? Definitely. And, and so they've done studies on breath work. They've done studies on deep meditation. Now, of course, you would have to sit in the mountains for probably 30 or 40 years in a state of meditation to ever get to where psilocybin is going to get you in a couple seconds. And a lot of the, the, the uh, monks dislike uh, psychedelics because it's like a cheat code to deep meditation. They've done brain scans of of monks in deep meditation, and there is shutting down the same region of the brain. Psilocybin shuts down what's called the default mode network in your brain. It decreases blood flow to this region. Uh, this is where all of our habits, where all of our, our trauma, where all of our depression is stuck. We live our lives as once we become adults in this region of our brain. We do the same shit every day. We make the same moves. We make the same decisions. We do everything. It's, we live our life on habits. Well, it shuts that down, and it forces your brain to make new neural connections, and um, it, it's expanding your mind. It's making your brain grow, and it's like a hard reset when you have depression stuck in these areas, right? Now, again, there's some mindfulness things you can do. Um, it's not going to get you where these supplements will or these medicines will, but at the same time, you have to treat these medicines with caution. A lot of people like to go out and party with them, and, and whatever your set and setting, whatever the influences around you are, will very much influence your, your experience with this medicine. It leaves you very open to suggestion. Meaning that if you have a lot of bad shit going on around you when you're doing these things, that bad shit's going to creep in, right? So it, it's, if you can't do it in the right setting with, with uh, people that are knowledgeable about what's going on, I would recommend just not doing it. Don't do it because it, it can be damaging if you, if you don't do it correctly, you know? Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, honestly, uh, I followed what Terrence McKenna recommended uh, in his lectures, which are on YouTube. And he said, hey, when you're doing it, do it by yourself in a dark area, lay down, and yep. just, you know, have the experience by yourself. And obviously, he's talking about... Put a good playlist in this. Yep. yep. Put that music in. I mean, obviously, he's talking about a higher yep. dose. Mm -hmm. um, I've also had quite a bit of experience with microdosing, which is where you take um, less than an amount, which can be noticeable. And for me, that unleashes just so much emotion. Like I get very emotional if I do microdosing often. And that's, in my mind, it can be, it's not really a good or bad yeah. thing. It's just um, something to be aware of. Like I, you know, get, can get very, uh, you know, if something pisses me off, it's going to piss me off like crazy because I've got to deal with that. You know what I mean? Whereas, you know, if something's happy, it's going to make me super happy like times 10. So even if you're microdosing, like that for me, I found is a better way if you're going to like, you know, be interacting with the public, the microdose route. But even then, you know, you've got to be, you got to so, be mindful yeah, that so, you're going to be emotional. You know what I mean? Like you're going to be, uh, might not be the day to do your taxes. Well, that day. <laughs> definitely. So the, the thing with microdosing and, and you get different things from, from, from different uh, doses, right? High dose is going to be the, the most fulfilling and best uh, response neurologically, 
psychologically, you're going to get more out of a high dose, right? It, it just does more to your brain. Um, what they found through through multiple studies is is microdosing is good for like ADHD, uh, um, attention issues. It puts you in a state of flow. It can make you. It, it can enhance cre creativity. A lot of people in um, uh, Silicon Valley microdose LSD and uh, psilocybin. So these things are super popular in, in rooms where you have to be creative, right? Um, I think uh, you really need to manage your dose. Like if you're having serious like uh, mood swings and things like that, it's a dosage issue. So what you want to do is on days that you're not, um, you don't have shit to do. When you, you can just stay at home, that's when you kind of play with your microdose, kind of figure out where it should be. Like you shouldn't really feel it. It should make maybe the trees a little bit greener and uh, you should feel a little more focused, but you shouldn't get that buzz that you get, you know? So yeah. uh, you want to find that happy space for, it, you know? A hundred percent. And um, dude, I've had so many days where I take some and I'm like, dude, I, that was a little more than a microdose. That might've been a, a real dose. Yeah, and right? <laughs> and uh, yeah, you're, dude, you're spot on, man. Sure, sure. And um, what I found for me is the best is like um, incorporating these, these experiences with therapy. So like when I was really healing a lot of my trauma and really be becoming the best version of myself and healing, um, you know, a lot that is from my past, I was combining the two. So I had the Talkspace uh, therapy app, which is where you can like text with your therapist. Mm -hmm. So I would literally be having the experience. Yeah, and then I could be texting my therapist while I was on the having the experience. And then we could then, okay. you know, process that over the next couple of days. And she would really help me to actually integrate what I was experiencing, you know, on that day where I had the experience. So, and dude, that was amazing. That works like that did it for me was combining those two together. Made a big difference. Yep. Yeah. Well, and that's why so Throughout these therapies, whether it's psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy or MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, uh, when you are in the experience by itself, they have two clinicians uh, on deck there, not to guide you at all. They're just there to, if you if you get to a space where you're uncomfortable, they can guide you back to comfort. That is the only reason they're there during the experience. They don't want to add suggestion. They don't want to push you in any direction. They want you to have that experience with the medicine, whether, like I said, with MDMA and psilocybin. Now, after you're done, the next day, they do an integrative uh, uh, therapy system se session where you actually talk about what you, what you dealt with, where you talk about the feelings you had, and uh, they're finding that the, this route is the absolute best route. So have your time with the medicine, then the next day, integrate it talk to your therapist and, and kind of uh, get it all out there and, 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 and make sense of what you, what you experienced. Dude, that's it, you know, and not being afraid of the shadow and not being afraid of going and, you know, processing what it is that you are traumatized over. And dude, like I've had people come and talk about exactly what you're saying, where what they end up processing often on these experiences is not just their own trauma, but they get visions of the past. So I have friends who, and myself too, have reported having these kind of ancestral experiences where they encounter the ancestors. They encounter people from previous generations who might be dead, like maybe their, their grandma or their grandpa, or even you know further back. And they have these sort of conversations with them, and they literally do process that generational trauma that we were talking about at the beginning. Yeah. Like, so it goes beyond just you. It does go, I believe, you know, collectively, like all of us together, all and, of us. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to have another uh, uh, meeting one day and, and talk about, because I, you know, I've, I've not experienced ayahuasca. I, it, it's in the plans. I'm going to eventually do it. But um, uh, from my studies of it, I mean, it is different than any other psychedelic out there. Like you're, you're going to have some experiences where you really, really uh, get in touch with maybe some of those uh, epigenetic markers that are in your body. Because listen, I mean, we're, we're, we're proving through science that our ancestors are in us. So maybe that's, that's what's happening through these uh, processes. Um, it's pretty interesting, man. Um, I would love to sit here and talk all day about this man me too we definitely man. have to reschedule this hell yeah um and, and be able to do maybe 
I'll, I'm down to do two hours with you, man. Because again, uh, you know, eventually I'm going to, we're, we're in the, the baby stages of it right now, just like the planning stages. Uh, I plan to start a podcast myself. And it's going to focus mainly on just just stress reduction, mental health, and, and, and just different strategies we can use to be the best, our best selves, whether it's uh, uh, success, it's, 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 it's um, mental health, just uh, whatever you can do to be the best version of yourself, that's what I want to talk about on a daily basis. So we're very much in the planning phases, but I would love to get with you a little bit more because you know the game. Uh, I, I still have a lot to learn about podcasting, so. Yeah, man, we can talk about Hell, that. Maybe we, can, maybe we can work together on it. Hell yeah, dude. That's what we do. Um, dude, I love that. And uh, let's have you back sometime for part two. And uh, dude, if anyone's listening to this and they want to know where to follow you, where should they go? If they want to stay tuned for more about the podcast you're doing and everything that you're working on, where should they go to check you out? Definitely follow me on Instagram at Champion the Sin. I've been better on Twitter, uh, not great on Twitter. I got to make sure I got my Twitter Twitter handle correct before I tell you what it is. Hold on. Um, so Champion Masin on Instagram, Masin Corbray on Facebook, and then on Twitter, it's going to be Masin Corbray as well. And that's M-U-H-S-I-N-C-O-R, B as in boy, B as in boy, R-E-Y. That's Twitter. That's going to be my Facebook. And then also on Instagram is Champion Masin. Masin, you're the man. Thank you so much, dude. Man, for being listen, on the show. a great time, man. I wish we had a little more time, but uh, let me know when you want to get me back on. I can talk about this stuff all day. Hell yeah, dude. All right, man. Well, hey, you have a good day, brother. Thank you. Important podcast, important podcast. Important podcast, important podcast. Important podcast, important podcast. Important podcast, important podcast.